Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim from San Jose Bible Baptist Church. So let's resume our studies on Revelation chapter 14. So we left off at verse 14 here. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. So John looked, and behold, so in other words, like, lo and behold, well, look at that. That's the idea. It's an old English wording. A white cloud. So there's a white cloud, and keep reading, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. So someone is sitting on the cloud, and this one person looks like the Son of Man. Notice that capitalization. Jesus Christ called himself the Son of Man many times throughout the Bible. So this person who looks like the Son of Man will actually be Jesus Christ, having on his head a golden crown. So he's wearing a golden crown on his head, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So he has a sharp instrument, and that's a sickle that he has in his hand. And those things are used to reap harvest, as some of you might know. What's going on over here? Well, He's about to rapture the tribulation saints. So notice over here that this passage at Revelation 14.14, 14, we looked at Revelation 14.1, where the 144,000, they're raptured up to heaven. And then when you look down over here, it's talking about that he's getting to, ready to rapture them up to heaven at verse 15. So let's keep reading verse 16. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth. So the one who's sitting on the cloud, Jesus Christ, thrust, he start to get out his sickle and what? Reap up the tribulation saints on the earth. And the earth was reaped. Notice right here, the earth was reaped. The tribulation saints on the earth were reaped up. They were raptured up. That's why it matches up with Revelation 14 about here, concerning about, in verse 3, the 144,000, which were redeemed where? From the earth. Why? It's because of verse 15 and 16. They were on the earth and they were reaped up. That's why they were redeemed from the earth. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, and Romans chapter 8, the redemption is not just referring to salvation in Jesus, but also referring to a rapture. So redeemed can also be referring to the rapture. So returning to what I was trying to get at is notice that there's a rapture of the tribulation saints at verse 15 and 16, but verse 1, they're already up in heaven. This shows here again that when you read the book of Revelation, you can't think that it's all just one nice sequence going on. No, even in the same chapter, you'll notice that there's different visions going on. Look at verse 14, which we read. I looked and behold a white cloud. John is now seeing something different. He's getting a different vision here. Whereas over here, at verse 1, he's seeing a different vision here. So different visions does not mean that it's going at a time orderly sequence. The idea is, is in the book of Revelation, is that all the time sequences, they're not in order, they're jammed up. They're like all mashed up together. Why? Because when you're receiving visions from God or revelation from God, God's giving a whole different viewpoints. That's the idea. It's a matter of viewpoints, not time sequence. That's very important to understand. So when people, there are some cultic people who try to teach the book of Revelation is in time sequence. And some of these weird cultic people, they try to 
teach that the book of Revelation is easy to understand. It's not all mashed up together where it's all mysterious. It's all in a nice time orderly sequence. Those people who talk like that have no idea what they're talking about. They have not read the book of Revelation even though they try to act like they're experts in the book of Revelation. That's just very amateurish and very childish. Acting like you're an expert on the book of Revelation when it should be a basic principle when you read it that it's impossible. It goes in a neat time orderly sequence. It makes way more sense when you know that it's called book of Revelation that when you receive revelation from God you're seeing different viewpoints within God giving you revelation rather than God giving you different uh, it's not God giving different time sequences in an orderly fashion it makes more sense God is giving you different viewpoints revelation is God revealing you and you're seeing it see you're seeing different points of view okay now as we continue on over here, there is a tribulation rapture, verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple. Okay, so verse 15 and 16, this angel comes out of the temple and then uh, tells the Son of Man to reap up the harvest. So let me read everything over here real quickly. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. So notice that the angel comes out of the temple up in heaven. Remember Revelation chapter, oh, was it 8? Chapter 8 where it talks about the temple up in heaven, the altar up in heaven. And Revelation, the last part of Revelation 11 kind of shows that as well if I recall. But anyways, you'll notice over here that the angel is crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. To Jesus, thrust in thy sickle and reap. So Jesus Christ is getting out his sickle and reaping. Why? For the time has come for thee to reap. So the time has come for Jesus Christ to reap up the harvest. For the harvest of the earth, earth is ripe. The earth's harvest is ripe to reap up with the sickle. And those are the tribulation saints, if you might recall. Now, if we return at verse 16, he that sat on the cloud, so that's Jesus, thrust in his sickle on the earth, so he's getting out that instrument to reap up the tribulation saints from the earth, and the earth was reaped. So notice over here that the earth was reaped up. The tribulation saints on the earth, they were reaped up. But verse 17, a different angel comes out of the temple in heaven, and this angel has a sharp sickle. That's different from verse 14, where Jesus Christ has the sharp sickle. Huh, what's going on? Verse 18, and another angel came out from the altar. Okay, so now... We see at verse 15, there's a distinction. This angel comes out of the temple. But at verse 18, this angel comes out from the altar, which had power over fire. Now remember this altar, uh, it has fire on it. And this particular angel has power over fire. If you read Hebrews chapter 1, uh, you'll notice that angels, they're ministers, and they also have power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him. So this angel is crying out particularly loud to him that had the sharp sickle. It's a little bit more emphasized, the loud cry, compared to the previous angel. So he's crying to him that has the sharp sickle. That's the angel, not Jesus, who has the sharp sickle. Saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel is saying to this other angel with the sharp sickle that you're, sup okay, use that sickle, thrust it in, okay, like reap it up with that sickle to gather what? Not harvest, but clusters of the vine of the earth. So these are literally grapes throughout the earth. Those uh, little portions of the clusters of the grape. 
Why? They're ripe. The grapes are ripe. So there's a distinction going on here is that it's a particularly loud cry compared to the previous angel and this angel comes from the altar rather than from the temple which uh, the angel at verse 15 comes out of the temple with the loud voice whereas in verse 18 this angel cries out from the altar now what's going on here why is there a distinction because in the temple, which is verse 15, the cry comes out of the temple so the tribulation saints can enter the temple. It's a rapture of tribulation saints. If you look at Revelation chapter 7, it talks about the tribulation saints in the temple serving. Whereas at verse 18, the cry comes from the altar. If you look at Revelation chapter 8, when God judges the earth for executing, persecuting the tribulation saints, the judgment comes out of the altar. So if you look at verse 18, that's why this cry comes out of the altar because it's judging the bad guys at the tribulation. They're the grapes of wrath, so to speak. And you'll notice it's a particularly loud cry. Why? To avenge the blood of the tribulation saints. Revelation chapter 6. And then that blood that's avenged is the tribulation saints, what? Crying out. And then remember, their cries have been heard at Revelation chapter 8, which is why the judgment comes out of the altar. Uh, you'll recall Genesis chapter 4. The blood of Abel cries from the ground. So that's the idea over here. It makes so much sense with scripture of scripture. Verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth. So the angel starts to use an instrument on the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So with the sickle, he gathers up the grapes from the vine of the earth. And then once he gathers it, he reaps it up, he, what? He throws it, casts it into a big wine press. And this is known as the wrath of God, this wine press where the grapes are in. Now, this wine press, what it is, is that you probably have seen it, like, I believe, in some foreign countries like Italy and in back in the days of Israel, where they would put huge clusters of vine or grapes into this huge circular pattern and it may have a little bit height of a couple inches of wall and then the people they would start stamping on the grapes and that's how wine is produced actually a lot of the people who drink wine that's how where it is born from it is born from it is actually formed from people stamping on these clusters of grapes and then it's like a dance they'll be like they're dancing and then that juice reaches up to the border of their garments actually so sometimes some people when they stamp on the grapes they'll be pulling up their garments a bit from their legs and that's what it's going to be like with God's wrath that's why it's called God's wrath because that grape juice it's going to represent the blood of the unsaved people. Now, that's why, if you recall Matthew chapter 26, Jesus Christ, he says that the great juice represents his blood. But he says that he's going to, what, drink it anew when at the kingdom of God, when he's coming in the future kingdom. So that's why Paul says at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the Lord's Supper of the grape juice is representing the Lord's coming, his second coming, when he's coming down in great wrath to judge the people. Why? Because at Jesus', Jesus first coming with that grape juice, it's representing his blood as salvation. But at his second coming, he's going to take that blood which is going to be the unbelievers wow 
Did you knew all of this before about the Lord's Supper when you're taking the Lord's Supper? It's not just you're recalling and you're remembering Christ's bloody death, but also you're going to be remembering Jesus Christ coming again in great wrath, taking the blood in vengeance of the lost people on this earth. Did you know that? If you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Don't, look, don't listen. Don't, look, don't listen with your ears open and going, uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, look at the verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Matthew chapter 26. Jesus and Paul says that it's going to be representing his future coming, Christ's future coming, not his death on the cross. Even though his death on the cross is represented at Matthew 26 and 1 Corinthians 11, they also mention his future coming.